Now we'll explore the mechanisms for radical reactions. We're going to look at the three distinct stages of the radical reaction. That is the initiation stage, the propagation stage, and the termination stage uh, as applied to the chlorination of methane. So uh, in the initiation uh, stage, we have a net increase in the number of radical species. Uh, at the start of the reaction, on the reactant side, we have zero radical species. And then uh, after homolytic cleavage, we have two radical species. So that's an indication that that's an in initiation. And note that we have the uh, single barbed arrow, the fishhook arrow. Uh, and the arrow begins where the electron comes from, and that is the, the shared pair and it goes to the chlorine atom. Uh, so each chlorine atom now uh, has an incomplete valence shell, but the charge of the electrons are equal to the charge of the protons, so they are uh, not ions. Now looking at the propagation step, uh, we have no net change in the number of the rad radical species. In the first, uh, propagation step, we have one radical species, and at the end of that, we have a single radical species, so no net change. The identity has changed, but the number hasn't. In the second propagation step, similarly, we have one radical at the start and one radical at the end of that second propagation step. So again, no net change. So this is a propagation step. Now, what you notice here is we have the hydrogen abstraction, and then our, our radical species uh, uh, cleaves the chlorine to, to give us back our chlorine radical. So at the end of the second step, we have the starting conditions of the first step. So this, this propagation can go on indefinitely as long as there is a reactant with abstractable hydrogens uh, present. This reaction is self-sustaining, so that, that's why it's a propagation step. It will, it will go on endlessly until uh, it runs out of uh, abstractable groups. Now, termination can happen when radicals uh, couple, and that can happen in a couple of different ways. We can have two of our chlorine radicals uh, combining uh, to, to couple and form chlorine gas. We can have our uh, methyl radical combining with chlorine to form a uh, chloromethane. We can have two methyl radicals combined uh, to form ethane. So, so any of these uh, will be termination steps. And again, the number of radical species on the left is two. The number of radical species on the right is zero. So there's a net decrease in the number of radicals. So this is a termination step. Coming back to our propagation steps, um, if you look at the sum of the propagation steps, it gives the net reaction. So uh, here we have uh, methane and the uh, chlorine radical the methyl radical and uh, HCl. Uh, here we have the methyl radical, uh, chlorine gas, uh, chloromethane, and the uh, chlorine radical. And when we sum these, we can uh, simplify and eliminate terms. And when you do that, we have the, the net reaction. So. Uh, the propagation step is a chain reaction. The products serve uh, the products of the last step serve as the reactants for an earlier step in the mechanism. And then, I don't think this is is confusing, but if you've looked at nuclear chemistry and uh, fission reactions, uh, those also are chain reactions. But those are runaway chain reactions. In this radical propagation step. The number of radicals at the end of the second step uh, has has not changed, so we're not we're not having a runaway chain reaction. We're not producing multiple radicals for every successful reaction the way that a nuclear chain reaction produces uh, multiple neutrons uh, 
uh, for every atom that is struck with a neutron. Now, if we look at the chlorination of methane, um, what we have to recognize is that polychlorination is, is very likely. In fact, it, it's almost impossible to prevent. The um, methyl chloride is going to be uh, more reactive towards radical uh, halogenation than methane was itself. So a second proton is going to be very easily abstracted um, and this is going to go on until we form carbon tetrachloride and we have fully substituted the uh, carbon with uh, chlorine. So the only way to prevent this is to have a large excess of methane relative to the amount of chlorine that's present in the reaction so that we can control this statistically by the number of collisions. Now I want to talk about initiation of a radical reaction. Uh, as you can see in this slide, um, when you have a dihalide like uh, chlorine, the uh, bond association energy uh, here is uh, 243 kilojoules per mole. If you look at some other compounds like alkyl uh, peroxides uh, or uh, acyl peroxide, so uh, benzoyl peroxide is an example of an acyl peroxide. So an acyl peroxide uh, has an, an acyl group, and uh, an acyl group is uh, a carbonyl connected to an L group, is a carbonyl attached to an alkyl group or to a, uh, a aryl group. You can think of it as a uh, carboxylic acid uh, without the uh, OH. So if you were to take a, a carboxylic acid and remove this, the function group that's left is the acyl group. So these alkyl and acyl peroxides have a uh, lower bond association energy and uh, homolytic cleavage can be performed uh, at lower temperatures or with less energy. So compounds like this are useful in uh, some commercial products. If you've ever used, uh, if you've ever done fiberglass repair and had to catalyze the uh, radical reaction of curing epoxy, uh, you add initiator to your epoxy mixture, and that will typically be an, an acyl peroxide. And uh, at room temperature, you will get enough bond cleavage to start that uh, chain reaction. That's uh, initiation. At the uh, terminating uh, or, or inhibiting radical reactions, uh, there are compounds that act as radical inhibitors. They react with radicals and prevent the chain process from from propagating or initiating. So they are molecules that uh, can stabilize the radicals and that can uh, rearrange to, to uh, eliminate the, the uh, radical. So oxygen is a di-radical. Um, it's capable of reacting with two other radicals. So it can, it can reduce the number of radical species uh, that are present. So for every, every mole of, of diatomic oxygen, you can consume two moles of radicals. Hydroquinone is a radical uh, inhibitor. Uh, we'll take a look at the electron pushing diagram in the next slide. Um, hydroquin hydroquinone is uh, sometimes added to ether as a uh, radical inhibitor to prevent the formation of uh, explosive peroxides. So when using ether, you need to consider, uh, you know, dealing with the risk of explosion, but also the presence of hydroquinone as a uh, inhibitor uh, if you um, 
if the presence of the hydroquinone interferes with your chemistry or whether its presence in your final product uh, needs a purification step. So in the case of uh, hydroquinone, um, we have the, uh, the radical electron uh, combining with the hydrogen and uh, homolytic bond cleavage and an electron from that bond combining with the uh, alkyl group to form our, uh, our alkyl compound. And then we're left with the uh, resin stabilized radical. And uh, this resin stabilized radical is long lived and can re also react with another radical species uh, undergoing uh, hydrogen abstraction on the other end of the, uh, on the other side of the ring. So now we have our uh, dye radical and we can draw the resonance structure uh, forming uh, benzoquinone. And that's the, uh, the stabilization or elimination of the radical uh, species. So next we're gonna go into the, uh, the thermodynamics of halogenation. Looking at the terms of the, the Gibbs free energy expression, we have the uh, enthalpic term and the entropic term, the enthalpy and the entropy. In the case of the radical reactions, the number of moles of reactants is going to be equal to the number of moles of products. So we can treat the uh, entropy term as essentially zero so that this will drop out. So the Gibbs free energy for a uh, radical reaction is going to follow the same trend as the enthalpy and the de delta G will be e essentially equal to the uh, value of delta H. Now we can estimate that delta H value based on bond dissociation energies for the bonds that are broken versus the, the bonds that are formed in this reaction. So in this case, uh, we have methane and we have a halogen uh, represented as, as uh, X2. That could be fluorine, chlorine, bromine, or iodine. We're gonna have an input of energy in the form of light to give us our homolytic bond cleavage. And we're gonna have hydrogen abstraction uh, to form our uh, hydrohalogen species. And then our uh, halogenated methane species. And what's given here are uh, the bond dissociation energies for all of the relevant bonds in kilojoules. So just to review, the um, enthalpy of the reaction can be calculated as the uh, sum of the bond dissociation uh, enthalpies of the uh, reactants minus the sum of the bond dissociation enthalpies of the uh, products. So in this example, I have uh, the uh, methane reacting with um, chlorine and uh, 435 kilojoules per mole, per mole and 243 kilojoules per mole are taken from the table. And uh, this is the, the uh, enthalpy for the uh, hydrogen abstraction and for the homolytic bond cleavage of chlorine. And then the next uh, two values here, these correspond to uh, the bonds formed. And those are uh, 351 and 431 kilojoules per mole for the formation of uh, chloromethane and HCl. And uh, pushing those numbers through the expression, the enthalpy is negative 104 kilojoules per mole. And the Gibbs free energy is essentially equal to that. So the negative, so delta G is negative, and we have a spontaneous or thermodynamically favorable uh, reaction. Coming back to our previous slide, with all of these bond dissociation energies, we can look at the thermodynamics for the different halogen reactions. And in our next slide, we've calculated that. And what you observe is the reaction with methane and fluorine 
is highly favorable with an enthalpy of negative, negative 431 kilojoules per mole. And going down to bromine, this is still a thermodynamically favorable, a spontaneous reaction. But when we come to uh, iodine, the reaction is endothermic. So this is not a spontaneous reaction, not a thermodynamically favorable reaction. Thinking about the consequences of these calculations, the fluorine reaction with methane is so exothermic that it's not practical to conduct. It's too violent uh, to conduct. The amount of heat uh, being liberated is too great and the speed of the reaction is uh, too great to be of any synthetic utility. The iodination is endothermic, uh, so this doesn't occur. The, uh, the only practical halogenations that we can perform are with uh, chlorine and bromine. Both of these are synthetically useful. When we look at chlorination and bromination, there are some differences. In the first uh, propagation step, the hydrogen abstraction step, what we see is chlorine, the hydrogen abstraction step, is exothermic, negative 21 kilojoules per mole. But in the case of bromine, the hydrogen abstraction step is endothermic, positive 42 kilojoules per mole. Looking at the second propagation step for both chlorine and for bromine, we have an exothermic reaction. And overall, the net reaction for both chlorine and for bromine are exothermic. But the first step for bromination is endothermic. And this leads to, uh, this is a feature that we can exploit. The bromination is much slower because of that endothermic hydrogen abstraction step. And this means the bromination is more selective. In the case of chlorine, the uh, energy of the transition state is roughly close to the energy of the reactants. So we expect the uh, transition state to resemble the reactants. Uh, this is following the Hammett postulate. In the case of the bromination, the uh, energy of the transition state is far from the energy of the reactants, but close to the energy of the product. This is the, the uh, hydrogen abstraction product, and this is the overall product. So the transition state much more closely resembles the product of the reaction in the case of the bromination. So looking at the uh, regioselectivity of uh, the chlorination reaction, for any substrate that's more complex than ethane, multiple monohalogenation products are possible. Earlier, we talked about polychlorination, but this is different. This is for a single chlorination, there are multiple sites that could, could be chlorinated. In the case of propane, we have the hydrogens on the two methyl groups uh, being chemically identical. And then we have the two hydrogens on the uh, methylene group uh, being identical. In the chlorination reaction, uh, chlorine is indiscriminate. So we'll get a significant amount of each product. So in a monochlorination, we'll have chlorination at, at this methyl group or this methyl group, those two compounds are, are indistinguishable for a monochlorination, as well as uh, either one of these protons being chlorinated. So we will have the uh, two chloro uh, propane product as well as the one chloro propane product. The distribution of our monochlorinated products bears out what we discussed earlier, and that is the stability of a secondary radical uh, is more stable than a primary radical.
similar to, to what we learned in first semester regarding carbocations. So the secondary halide is the major product and the primary halide is the minor product. What this graph is showing is because the secondary radical is more stable, the energy of the transition state is slightly lower. So this reaction will proceed at a uh, higher rate. For the bromination reaction, which is much slower, we can exploit this selectivity uh, to produce the uh, secondary uh, bromination product at a much higher uh, percentage, almost 97% Ninety-seven percent uh, two bromo propane, and only three percent of one bromo. So it is the uh, Hammond postulate that uh, we invoke to explain the uh, selectivity of the brominated uh, product. So focusing on the hydrogen abstraction step, because that is the rate determining step. In the case of the chlorination uh, transition state, this energy, this distance, uh, the transition state is closer to the reactants than the transition state is to the products. So this transition state will resemble the reactants. Whereas in the bromination, the transition state is much closer to the uh, intermediates uh, than it is to the reactants. Uh, so it will uh, resemble the, the, uh, the product. Uh, and we can envision this as the uh, extent of the uh, hydrogen carbon bond being broken and the chlorination the, the uh, bond is only beginning to break uh, in the transition state uh, that it resembles the reactant, uh, whereas in the bromination, the bond is nearly broken. This, this is much closer to completion in the bond, uh, bond breaking in the uh, bromination step. So in the bromination, the stability of the carbon radical uh, is a much larger factor uh, because the carbon radical is uh, more fully formed in the transition state in the bromination reaction. Where in the chlorination, the uh, transition state doesn't depend uh, very highly on the stability of that secondary radical. Uh, the reaction is, is going to occur before that uh, charge separation has developed. So this is why the chlorination reaction is relatively nonspecific in comparison to the bromination. So just to, to sum up, the difference in the transition state energies for the formation of a primary versus a secondary versus, versus a tertiary radical is much bigger for bromination. So bromination will be more selective uh, for the lower energy pathway. So it will favor the tertiary radical over the secondary, over the primary. Looking at relative rates, bromination at the tertiary position happens at 1600 times uh, more often than at, the, than at the primary position. So in the case of a uh, tertiary, the uh, brominated product uh, will will be a 100% uh, uh, yield uh, compared with, with only about 65% yield in the equivalent uh, reaction using uh, chlorine. So we've looked at the slower reaction with bromine in comparison to chlorine. If we look at the, the uh, more rapid reaction with fluorine, Fluorine is the fastest process, and this is the least selective. So if we look at the distribution of products, primary, secondary, and tertiary fluorination, with fluorine, uh, 
there's there's uh, very little selectivity. Um, you know, uh, four to five times less than with chlorine. So our transition state for the uh, fluorination is much is even closer to the reactants than it was for chlorine, and the charge separation uh, has not developed uh, very much at all at the point that the hydrogen is abstracted by fluorine. Now, a few slides back when we looked at our example of uh, propane, and we said there were uh, two locations for, for chlorination. We could have chlorination at the methyl groups, which were equivalent chemically. Or we could have chlorination at the secondary position, and these two protons were equivalent and uh, in a monochlorinated product, it would be it would be the same result. If we look at uh, more complex uh, alkanes, so in this case we have uh, butane, uh, chlorination at the secondary position uh, creates a chiral center. Uh, because our our uh, four substituents on this carbon are all uh, are all different, so uh, we will form uh, we we will not have any uh, chiral selectivity. So uh, two chlorobutanes will form as a racemic mixture. We can explain the formation of the racemic mixture using uh, a molecular orbital perspective. Uh, we began uh, this chapter talking about the uh, orbital hybridization and the uh, radical being either trigonal planar or a shallow uh, pyramid uh, rapidly inverting. And uh, I think I said that, that these structures were periplanar, that they are essentially uh, 